The following is a conversation with my dear friend, Dr. Jamie Cripwell. Jamie is a lecturer at the School of Process Engineering at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. He holds his PhD in chemical engineering, specializing in thermodynamics. Jamie and I met in 2008. I stuffed this up the first minute into the video despite bragging about the fact that I worked it out. We met in 2008 in our first year of uh, chemical engineering undergraduate at the University of the Witwatersrand, or WITS for short, in Johannesburg, South Africa. Here we talk about what it is about chemical engineering that seems to be universally difficult and why students find it really difficult. We talk about postgraduate studies, what are the reasons you should or shouldn't do your masters. We talk a little bit about coding and about the field in, in general. Uh, the audio is a little bit rubbish and that's on me, so I hope you can look past the, the bit of feedback that comes up every now and then. But I hope that the conversation that we have is really useful to you. If you're having some doubts about your degree, whether to do chemical engineering, or you need some help making a decision whether you should study further. Enjoy. Jamie. You yes, and man. I first met 10 years ago. Can you believe it? Um, that was in, no. I, 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 I had to work it out, 2008. Um, sure. It, it's quite crazy. So in terms of our backgrounds, we, we, came, we went to the same university. We met in our chemical engineering degree. We came from similar backgrounds from our high schools uh, in that both of our high schools were what would be called Model C schools in South Africa, mm -hmm. all boys schools, very close to where we, uh, where we went to university. Mm -hmm. um, and they were like rival schools, right? With like daytime boarding. And uh, so you so, say rivals, but you know, definitions. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you guys always thought someone else was your competition, right? <laughs> Dick. <laughs> um, and yeah, so, so we met in our chemical engineering degree, and uh, you ended up being the best man at my wedding. And uh, that wasn't too long ago. Um, what no. else? um before we get into the work stuff have i what do you want people to know about you and how we met at, at varsity um sure yeah got to think about it now for a second uh but what we met well i distinctly remember my first sort of real memory of you was actually at that that district awards thing yeah um, for the school marks <laughs> Because I, I I vaguely remember sitting next to whoever I don't know a girl that came whatever she came and we were looking at your surname and we we were like trying to puzzle between us how to pronounce your surname and then when you rocked up and sat down I was like oh that guy's He's in, in my, my class, class. <laughs> this yeah. was some yeah this was uh, some academic awards for uh, for high school but, yeah. but we'd yeah. already met met at university yeah. Yeah. I, that's also quite yeah. a vivid memory for me. Um, yeah. No. How how long after we started university was that? Can you remember? I think it was. I think it was fairly early still. I mean, we I weren't think, friends I think at we that stage. Like yeah, I think we had pretty much only done the sort of orientation things and maybe a week of actual classes yeah. or something. Yeah, because um, yeah, we still like rocked up in our, uni our school uniforms. Uh -huh. So lucky we had them. <laughs> so so yeah. one of the most vivid memories I have of you is I remember you saying that your plan in life was to, you wanted to get your chemical engineering degree, you wanted to go into industry, pick up whatever you need to pick up, work for a little bit, and you always had a passion for teaching, and your dream was to go to your old high school and teach history at some stage and retire doing that. And yeah. so uh, you took a bit of a shortcut in that regard. You wanna, you wanna say what it is that you do? Yeah, so I now, having after doing my, my master's and PhD, I'm now a lecturer um, at Stellenbosch University. So. Yeah, as you say, sort of really came full circle in terms of, you know, originally I thought I wanted to be a teacher. Now I'm ultimately just teaching a fancier thing. Um, yeah, so, and I'm enjoying, you know, I don't regret a minute of it. I definitely wouldn't have predicted the path I took to get here. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, it's, yeah, really enjoy it. Okay, so if King Edward the Seventh School still wants to hire a history teacher, they, you you could be convinced at some stage in your life. Yeah, maybe maybe when I have my midlife crisis. But, um. okay. <laughs> right. Well, you're due for one soon, I believe. 
<laughs> says he. Uh, did he did you mention where, where you lecture? Uh, at Stellenbosch University, yeah, so Department of Process Engineering. Yeah, so you moved down from Johannesburg down to, to the Western Cape in South Africa. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right, for my master's. So, I mean, that was that was originally under the idea that if I had done a postgrad degree, then I'd have a better shot at getting placed in R&D at Sassel. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, that's history. <laughs> yeah. So maybe just to give a little bit of background, you you and I share something else that's quite similar in that we were both Sassel Bursa. Sassel, the biggest refiner in South Africa and the biggest um, Bursa of, of chemical engineers. And the idea is that uh, for every year of tuition that they pay for, you go and work for them. And actually, that's a, that's a picture of Secunda in the background there. I think you went there before I did. Uh, yeah, <laughs> my vacation work at Sasselberg. So, um, so you you had the, we you and I had the same bursary, and uh, where I I wanted to do my masters, I actually interviewed with them for another bursary to do my masters, and I got rejected for that because they wanted me to start working. You had mm -hmm. the opportunity to 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 carry on doing your masters. How did that mm -hmm. How did that turn out? Yeah, no, as you know, so as I said, it was it was something that I I had two very different experiences during vacation work, and I, I I found that I really enjoyed more of a research work environment as opposed to you know sort of a day to day plant running uh, sort of environment, I suppose. Um, yeah, and, and so, you know, having spoken to my line manager at the time, who was himself a Stellenbosch alumnus, you know, he put me in touch with the department saying, you know, doing postgraduate studies is is a good foot in the door for a reason, for a, a position in the, the R&D field. Um, and yeah, that, that was my first point of contact at the university, uh, put in an application, submitted my provisional undergraduate marks at the time and you know they were they were happy to take me at the end of my undergrad i mean bursary wise it was just a matter of freezing it um at the time Cecil gave me permission to study um, mm. but it, it's actually it was sort of at the same time as oil was taking a bit of a dip and people were being laid off so you were kind of lucky in that regard that you got let go uh lucky in some ways maybe not lucky now I, I, I don't know you you wouldn't say you were unlucky right yeah, I think, you know, at, at the, as I said, you know, originally the, the plan was always to go back to Sassel. Um, so when that didn't come through, uh, I, I think it's fair to say I felt a bit lost for, for a little while, um, you know, and so that was, that was when I was transitioning from master's to PhD. It sort of put the final go ahead uh, to do PhD. Um, but um, yeah, you know, so I, I did. In, in hindsight, I, I, I don't. Re again, I don't regret it, anything of it. I'm glad it happened the way it did. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to do a four-year undergrad degree for nothing, mm -hmm. um, and and yeah. had to pay nothing back for it. So you know, it, it definitely wasn't a bad thing for me at all. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm actually yeah, it's probably worth saying I'm hell of a grateful for for the fact that I, I got what I got from from Cecil because yeah, I, I couldn't afford to study. Absolutely. I think you were in a similar position. And without Absolutely, them, yeah. I don't know where I'd be. So mm. um, that you you touching on, so you gently touching on, um, you know, the idea of masters, PhD. Should I? Shouldn't I do it? I the mm. whole idea for me starting this was that I think resources that are available for for chemical engineering students. It's called process with Pat because I wanted to encapsulate process engineering, but because mm. you know. Mm. When you study, it's chemical engineering. I think when you start working, no one talks, no one really says I'm a chemical engineer, right? That's I'm a process yeah. engineer with a chemical engineering degree. Yeah. But um, so it is aimed at, at, at the younger chemical engineers. And what I find people go to is, uh, I spend a lot of time on Reddit to see what people discuss and what, they, what questions are being asked. And one of the most common things are, uh, it, it's just multiple threads on should I do master? Should I do PhD? Is there any benefit? It seems to me the general ideas uh, or the, the, what people want to get from the thread is, is it a good career move to do my master's? What are your mm. thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, so obviously I need to start with a massive caveat of I never ultimately ended up in industry. Uh, so I can't, I, I, I can only speculate and, and, and speak from, from people that I know's experience. But um, 
Yeah, you know, the feedback that we get from people who, who, who do their postgraduate degrees, go into industry, you know, people who, who, who in industry who hire people who have got their postgraduate degrees is, is, is it, it teaches a little bit more of a sort of an independence, um, you know, independence skills, being able to research something by yourself, um, you know, creating the links that maybe weren't always apparent between modules that you learned in isolation, um, you know, perhaps despite the best efforts of, of the undergrad degree, trying to show you the links between mass transfer, thermodynamics, etc. Um, you know, so being able to really pursue something to the depth that you do in a master's, I think just it, the main thing you take from it is, is, is learning to do things independently, source information for yourself, really, uh, you know, do something by and for yourself. Um, I think that's very, certainly in, in our case, that, that wasn't always the case in the undergraduate program. You know, our, our big design project was a group work. Our laboratory project was in, it was in pairs. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, it's an independence thing. And I think that's the, that's the benefit I sort of, the advantage I've gained being on this side of the coin now is you see that that maturity transition that happens. And I think I, I again speculate that the same happens for, for, for candidate engineers, you know, in, in the first year that they work. But you know, to come back to the feedback that we get about what a master's gives a student is is there's less of that learning curve when they do go into industry. They're able to sort of hit the ground running almost. Um, obviously, mm. you know, sort of process specific information still needs to be picked up, but um, the feedback is that there's a maturity and, a, and an independence that comes from uh, someone with a postgrad. They, they can sort of source things for themselves, whereas uh, the undergrads still need, still need that bit of maturity and, and okay. linking. So, um, so you're talking about feedback. So you're in touch with ex-students of yours that have done their masters and then go into industry. Yeah, indeed. And then to what extent does the topic that you pursue in your post, uh, maybe I should say, I don't have, yeah, I think I did mention, I don't have my master, so I've got no, no idea what happens after you graduate. Um, to what extent should one be worried about what they study, uh, what, what they pursue in their postgraduate degree? Um, again, you know, I need to stop, obviously, by saying in a South African context, um, you know, masters, uh, masters is, can be either done as a, as a taught master's or a research master's. Um, you know, the research master's, you're focusing very specifically on a project. It's akin to PhDs, which are done around the world, just to a, lot, a smaller extent. But, you know, in terms of worried, being worried about over-specializing in, in, a, in, a, in a master's degree, at least, uh, you know, PhD maybe is a different story. It's not really something, it's not really a, concern, a valid concern. Um, you know, I think the... The studying in a field and then working in the same field obviously has benefits, but it certainly doesn't limit you from other fields per se. Um, I, as far as I know, I've never met anyone who got who got hired or rejected on the basis of the topic of their postgrad. Mm. Um, you know, I think that's the important thing. You know, you certain positions might look for someone who has experience in a certain field, and so if the stars aligned and you research that in your postgrad, you know, kudos to you. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's certainly not limiting from for South African graduates anyway. Right. Um, PhD arguably can be a little bit more fine tuned. Um, you know, there you're very much delving into, into unexplored territory in a very focused area. Sometimes that can, you know, that, that can, propel you in a certain uh, direction. Um, but again, very few, in fact, no one that I've ever met with a PhD has been explicitly, or felt that they were explicitly excluded from a position based on what they studied. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I like what you say, because if you, it, it sort of encapsulates why I think chemical engineering is difficult as a degree to, as a degree to study is because there is such a diverse range of applications and to get an undergraduate degree you need to be exposed to all that sort of you know they don't know whether you're going to go into refining uh, refining food pharma water mining did i say mining but th that's one thing for me that i remember is that we learned we did like solids handling operations and i remember breakage functions of ball mills which i've never used in my life and it's <laughs> it 
that's it, it's not important that I that I know how to you know I, I need to go know where to go look for the breakage functions if I ever go work in in mineral handling in mineral processing right it's just mm -hmm. good enough to know that it's there and mm -hmm. whether or not I did it as a course is not going to determine whether I get a job or not I, I, is my feeling then again I, you know I don't know what it's like being a graduate 10 years later from when I graduated and applying for jobs so Mm. um do you yeah uh, i suppose there's there's something there i'm babbling now but do you, do you think there's a chance that okay maybe someone else did a master's that's more specific to a job application and maybe they're better suited yeah i mean i think that's i think that's arguably the only thing that goes these days you know i think the the environment is tough at the moment for you know for the pandemic the the as you said sort of oil taking a dip, which was, which was the big employer in the South African context anyway. So I think that what, what a postgrad does give you is perhaps a step up over people with undergrads, you know, competing for the same position. But as I said before, I think the step up there is the maturity that I spoke about earlier, rather than, you know, specific, um, specific knowledge. Um, you know, I think something you can talk to more than me is, you know, the fact that when you go, when you do go work, a lot of things you, if you don't completely relearn them, you know, it's something that you have little to no context about anyway, you know, so it, it's, it's your undergrad degree serves to give you the tools that you can use to start understanding a thing. I don't, you know, I think we, you think you're kidding yourself if you think a four-year degree will give you absolutely everything you need to run any, any sort of engineering job anywhere. It, it, the goal, that's not the goal. The goal is to, to just teach, you know, teach you to think correctly, you know, mm. critically analyze, mm. make those linkages between these different sort of fundamental and, uh, you know, application based sciences. And, yeah. 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 <laughs> so if, I, if I think about the general atmosphere in my head versus uh, it, while I was studying, it was mostly just a mixture of stressed and drunk. Um, but that that feeling that I had is not the same thing I have while working. Maybe it's a little bit different for you because you are in that academic space a lot more. But do do you generally feel different if you can remember what that was like? Yeah, it's I, I, I don't know. I'm pretty sure an educational psychologist has a name for it. But I, I'm very much on the flip side of the coin of of, of suffering a, a teacher's angst when my students don't get the things that I really feel they should. But every now and then I have those sort of moments of epiphany where I'm like, hold on, I was a student too. I'm pretty sure I did dumb things and didn't spend the time I should have on this specific concept as well. You know, so uh, I think definitely the context is different, and it's you know sometimes I, I can put myself in this in the shoes of a student better than others. Um, but I mean, you know, definitely, I think the whole, if you can teach from hindsight, you know, there, there are a hundred things a day that I tell myself, damn it, if I had done this better in undergrad, I would, you know, I would maybe not be in a completely different position to what I am now. It's not necessarily what I'd want, but I'd certainly have had a greater appreciation at the time, could have maybe used it somewhere between then and now, you know, but I suppose that's true of anything. <laughs> Say a little bit more about that because I, I quite like it because chemical, it, apart from if we go back to what happens on Reddit, apart from uh, should I do my master's or not, there's, there's rants. There's a lot of rants, not just from chemical engineers, but engineering mm -hmm. students in general about my prof is so shit, my lecture is so rubbish. Um, why, you know, how, and then this is what happened with the test. And I can, I can come up with a story about what happened with the specific test. There was that one mass balance we were given in first year where it was over-specified and it was possible to- Orange uh, juice. <laughs> I can't remember the, whether it was orange juice or desalination where we were doing like ice balances. Um, yeah, yeah. But it was over-specified and there were two answers. I, I just get yeah. stressed thinking about that. Um, mm. Do you do you still see that? Is, is, is it, to what extent is it just because actually you just need to go through the motions, this is new and it's inevitably going to happen? Or, of course, there's a small component that's bad lecturing, right? Yeah, no, of course. You know, I think, uh, again, I think, you know, I, what a big, my personal opinion, a, a big thing that the, the sort of first world universities have over us is they sometimes draw distinctions between teaching and research positions, whereas in a South African context, you, you sort of are supposed to do it all. And and as you say, some people are not, are not trying to be teachers, you know, and so... 
of course you could have a bad teacher and perhaps that person doesn't want to teach to begin with. I didn't but want I think, to knock on lectures. I, I, I actually meant from the other perspective of, is it, uh, is it the case that actually, you know what, you're going to have to put up with some things that are just difficult. You're not going to get it. You're not going to mm -hmm. like it. Suck it up and move on. Yeah, I think there's definitely an element of that. I mean, I uh, I don't know if you can call it. I've had the 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 the, uh, the benefits of of teaching that course, mass and energy balances, um, and you know, again, seeing it from this side of the tunnel, it's 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 obviously very easy to say, you know, oh, why don't you get these things? And I mean, I distinctly remember going through exactly these problems myself. Um, you know, I, I I distinctly remember halfway through second year effectively failing the module until I sort of pulled my socks up, put the time in that I needed to do and, and you know, came right. Um, Can you remember towards, what it was? Um, well, I, I remember the moment where I pulled my socks up and realized there was a problem, uh, you know, going to see my lecture and, and sort of discussing what I needed to do about it. And then I, I, I just distinctly remember that the very next the test, the next test that we had was about particle size distributions and a mass balance in a mineral processing plant. And I got 80 or something percent for the test, which pulled me up sort of where I needed to be. Um, yeah, you know, and things started clicking from there. I think, I think that's the key thing. You know, everyone has that moment. It's an aha moment. You know, you talk to lecturers, you talk to teachers. There's nothing better than that moment. Where you can see it in someone's eyes when it just, you know, it's like, I get it now. Mm. And I think, you know, again, in a South African context, I think it's a remnant of the schooling system. I think students are very focused on getting the answer rather than necessarily appreciating the thought process that goes into getting there. And they hate to hear that. I hated to hear that. And now I find myself preaching the exact same thing to my students. <laughs> Um, you know, as with anything, it's something I think you appreciate later once you do have it. It's a lot easier to say, oh, you know, I was spending my time in the wrong places. Um, but, you know, it's, it's as you, you know, you, I think the way you phrased it is, is exactly that. It's a process that you have to go through. Um, you know, some people it takes longer than others, um, you know, and, and you'll get there. You invest the time, you'll get there. You make me think of the very the very first video I did right was what happens when you mix two different pressures because do you do you remember <laughs> going and asking that exact question in our final year I, design? I, I more I more remember how much it bugged you <laughs> in watching the video. I, I it, it brought to memory when us going to ask about it. Um, but I don't when, when we discussed me. it, is that a memory? No, no. When I when, I, when we discussed you talking about the topic, I distinctly remember it it being an issue in our group and you wanting to go and and, and resolve it with the lecturer. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean the actual discussion with the lecturer, I don't specifically recall. But it, do you know it? It was it was that one where he says, "Oh, you know, this is all." <laughs> the, the response was. You know, it's all got to do with things like Bernoulli and Charles Law and Boyle's Law and Cole's Law. And then he asks us, yeah. well, you, know what, you know what Cole's <laughs> Law is, right? And we all kind of think and go, no. And he said, it's like the salad made out of cabbage and carrot. And it was like the most infuriating point at yeah. which he could have told us a dad joke because I still didn't get it. <laughs> and all I needed was for someone to tell me. I don't know at what point, I didn't have an aha moment. It's just looking back mm -hmm. on it. I understand that I didn't understand it. And at some point I did. It's that yep. we didn't have to calculate it. We had to pick it. You know, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's not, there was no possible way of us calculating the downstream pressure unless yep. we knew the flow rates and the geometry of both, right? So that's all he needed to say. You pick it, you don't. But I suppose in his defense, he didn't, he didn't know what I didn't know or what I didn't get. Mm. And, yeah, you know, and it's, mm, sorry, Terry. No, sorry. I, I, no, no, you, yeah, I'm interviewing you for goodness sake. So you, you please. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I was going to say, I think it, it also comes back to, it sounds like, you know, what I sort of call a student mindset in a way where, where again, we're sort of, we're fixating on the answer to my question, mm. um, you know, but you maybe you're asking the wrong question to begin with, you know, and, and as you say, in hindsight, we realize that, that that's exactly the case. We were asking the wrong question, but we didn't know we were asking the wrong question. And that, you know, that does come up a lot, you know, again, a remnant of the school system is, 
you have a problem, find the answer. And until you have the answer, that's what you fixate on rather than, you know, what goes into getting there and the principles behind it, which is arguably the more important side of it. I do want to challenge that and sort of back you up a little bit because in all of in all of the things I want to discuss in my videos, I always I always relate it back to this is what I didn't get. I lacked context. Let me give you some context for this problem to help you understand. And it mm. feels like I'm bashing university and lecturers, and that's not my intention because what I realized is, mm. as a at university, you the focus has to be on the mathematics and the problem solving and the you know the, the what's written down on the piece of paper. You can't test a concept. You need to give mm -hmm. someone a problem and ask them to solve it because that's the only way to assign marks. Um, mm -hmm. So, so there's no getting around that effectively. If if an institution is going to accredit someone and say this person is qualified enough to go and work as an engineer. Yeah, you know, I think I think engineering at the end of the day is an is an application based science. So part of the education has to be testing, you know, a student's ability to apply. Um, you know, so the, the whole idea of, of testing a concept is possible, but it's difficult to do, you know, in the space of arguably a three hour exam where you have many things to test, which, you know, at the end of the day, one of my one of my colleagues likes to say, you know, that at the end of the day, you need 50 percent in a module because we say 50 percent in that module means, you know, enough to be an engineer in the context of, of the theory of that module. We don't expect our students to have 100%, um, you know, to know everything. You just need to know sort of the basics and everyone can have an off day in, in assigning it. And I think, I think to a degree, perhaps, that is reflected in that kind of calculation-based question. Anyone can have an off day and put the wrong number in their calculator. And to fail, you know, to fail a test or a module for that reason, as opposed to a fundamental understanding yeah, maybe maybe that's what I, mean. I anticipate people hearing and saying, you know, I wouldn't want my doctor only getting fifty percent, or my pilot, or my other pilots are probably not that. You know, it's all automatic, anyways. But I don't I don't want engineers with only fifty percent. But you know, you need to know everything. But realistically, I just rewrote my I, to get my driver's license here. I need to convert from my South African one, and I had to redo my driving theory test. And it's a lot more difficult in Denmark than it is in South Africa. It's like yes, no questions. And being conservative is not the correct approach. Um, and I'm getting driving theory questions wrong, right? So there's something about a testing environment that, it, you know, it, it, it's the best we've got, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're competent or incompetent, but we don't have anything else to gauge on, right? It can't be exactly. a touchy feely exactly. thing. Yeah. And I mean, you know, again, something you can comment on better than I can in an industrial context is, no, no one is going to invest millions or billions of dollars in in a plant that you designed mm -hmm. by yourself. You know, you're, you're going to work in a team. People, you're going to do a calculation. Ten other people are going to check your calculations, and you're going to check Absolutely. the calculations of ten other people. And I think that's the important thing. It's we're testing, we're we're giving people the ability to do those checks on each other, and and sort of, you know. The yeah, cliche, I mean, some is greater than the it's, whole. It's a huge, huge process. In engineering, is you have review sessions and there's a checker and there's an approver and, and you need to because we do make mistakes. And mm -hmm. there are designs that go out all the time that have mistakes in them. And mm -hmm. to some extent, that's why we use factors, right? Safety factors and things because... I'm not... Okay, I'm not saying we use safety factors to compensate for our, our calculation mistakes, but... The, it, there's no such thing as a perfect answer in, 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 in engineering because that answer, the answer that you get is based on the assumptions anyways. And those assumptions exactly. will be wrong. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's, that's really what we're actually trying to impart to people at the end of the day. You know, with all due respect, a high school student can crunch the numbers if you give them an equation and, and the values that go into it. You know, what we're really trying to impart to people is, is making, you know, thinking critically like that, making valid assumptions or, or, or having the, the, the confidence and the ability to question mm -hmm. the assumptions of others that they think are invalid, you know? So it's, 
that's really what people should be striving for and and you know ultimately implementing i suppose on the, on the back end mm. as a student you just don't necessarily appreciate that because you're not always re- you're not rewarded with marks per se for mm. for for only applying that whole process you know as you say we need to quantify these things at the end of the day what what, what you, hearing you say that makes me think of is what happens after you graduate from chemical engineering and start working is if you work for a big company, it's it's not like you, companies have tools, you know, whether you're working for a design company or you go and work for a, um, a in an operations environment, there will be existing tools uh, set up by other engineers over many years. And you're likely going to end up driving those tools. And it, it sort of goes from you being strained at university, doing hardcore calculations, lots of maths, because that's what you're being graded on, to driving someone else's spreadsheet. And it, it would be a benefit to you not to for that not to be like a relief, like, okay, now it gets easy, but use those mm-hmm. principles and a bit of enthusiasm to try and transfer that to, to a work mm-hmm. environment. Because it's easy mm-hmm. to drive an Excel spreadsheet and not know whether it's, it's giving rubbish or not, right? Exactly. Even if it works. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's, it's a mass balance. Rubbish in is rubbish out. Uh, absolutely. It depends how much juice you put in. <laughs> oh, oh, what? What was it? Pulp. Pulp. Pine pulp <laughs> solids. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it left an impression, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, uh, to what extent do you think us talking about our studies 10 years ago is now old news, not relevant anymore? Uh, you know, the world has totally changed. Uh, or is it still relevant? It's just got a bit more online in terms of online classes and Zoom meetings and things. Yeah, you know, I think in terms of the dynamics of of what class looked like for you and me versus what it does today, I mean, for example, you know, the graduating classes for undergrads now are are three times the size what they were when when we finished. Um, You know, so it's certainly it's it's bigger in a way. Um, You know, I think, but definitely the world that the graduates are entering is also different from what we entered you, you know you, you you've already said that when we when we got our bursaries you know it was the golden the golden years for for oil and petrochemicals and when we finished it, it, it was on started to be on the decline um you know so i think that's that's still true that is still going to be true i think the the you know the the traditional uh, you know, safe havens for where the engineers work will, will change with time but ultimately you know, a good colleague of mine says, chemical engineers create consumables. You know, we will still consume as a society. Where those consumables come from will change. Um, you know, it won't necessarily be petrochemical basis. It will be renewables and, and and the like. And you'll still need people to drive those processes, drive those spreadsheets, as you said. Mm-hmm. As you, said. Uh, you know, so the, the fundamentals haven't changed. I think it will just be... You, Arguably, people will there'll be a lot more sort of smaller uh, consulting roles than necessarily these big conglomerate companies. Um, again, you know, I need to speak from a South African context. Anyway, we're seeing a lot of that. A lot of our graduates go and work for smaller companies that have very sort of specific, uh, you know, contractual or or uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, like working on a contract basis. Or? Yeah, that, obviously you won't include <laughs> this in your video. No, chill, man. It doesn't matter. You're, what's the word I'm looking for, man? You're, you're like liaising with people. It's not your project. You're, spe- you're like a specialist. Consulting. That's the one. <laughs> okay. Consulting. Maybe we should cut yeah. that one out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm glad you yeah, said you know, that. So and think... I'm, I'm really glad you said that in the South African context because I, I, I fear the other, I, I don't want, you know, I don't want to live in a world filled with like big conglomerates that control everything. So, so, so I hope that is the case. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking from a, a relatively small sample pool. As you said, we, we, we only finished 10 years ago. I don't have that many uh, graduates under my belt. Um, you know, but it's 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 certainly the way things are going. Um, you know, the the messages we hear back, the the jobs that people do ultimately find themselves in. Um, you know, a lot of them are these sort of smaller companies. There, there's a lot of these smaller companies with sort of environmental, sorry, with an environmental focus. 
um, you know, which wasn't or, or certainly didn't feel as as prevalent as today as it does when we finished. Um, you know, I might have been looking through petrochemical goggles at mm. the time. Um, you know, and I think that'll become a lot more prevalent as as we go. Uh, you know, you're seeing, you're even starting to see shifts. In, in, in curricula, you know, mm. the fourth industrial revolution and machine learning is, are, are massive buzzwords. And, you know, we, we would be remiss if we didn't sort of try and, and, and get, give some knowledge and, and, and at least a foot in the door to our new graduates in that direction. Uh, you know, and the same is true for environmental aspects. And so we see that already slowly being incorporated into, into the curricula. Um, yeah, and, and I think that'll continue <coughs> As we go, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about that because I, I see that back to Reddit, a very common question: What should I do this summer holiday? Uh, this is Northern Hemisphere, right? So, um, should, should should I learn how to code in Python? Now, I don't know how to code in Python. I probably could figure it out. I did a bit of code. You know, I can do VBA and stuff if necessary. I I've done coding in specific languages in companies mm. I work for. Um, mm. Do but yeah, I don't see that as I don't feel under pressure to go and learn, say Python specifically. Um, mm. Maybe because I, I've got a quite a I'm comfortable in my role and I know what I'm good at and I don't need to go that way. Do mm. yeah, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, chemical engineering sits in this very sort of interesting nexus niche between a very practical science you know a very practical uh, you know science hardcore processes based field but then also you know we do do a lot of maths a lot of uh, computer skills software skills that go into that so we are certainly positioned to 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 handle that kind of thing and i think in many undergraduate degrees you see that coming in in the in the third and fourth years when you talk about dynamic modeling and process controls and that sort of thing so you know i think certainly some people Come in with the expectation of of learning those softer skills, the the you know the the dynamic modeling, um, and others maybe come in with with learning you know an expectation of being more physical hands on, mm. um, you know. And so I think in terms of expectations of people leaving nowadays, I don't think there's necessarily an expectation on graduates to be uh, Pythonistas, um, you know. But it's certainly Is that a, the it's term. Certainly a, uh, apparently, <laughs> I'm getting um, old. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No. So you know, I think I, I, I think it's just an upskilling issue. You know, I think it can only help to have that experience. You know, it, it's 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 an age-old debate. Uh, you know, being being a MATLAB uh, fundi versus you know a Pythonista. MATLAB licenses are expensive. You know, and and again, if you're going to go look, work for one of these smaller sort of startup companies. Chances are very good that they're not going to be able to afford a, a MATLAB license, you know. So ha either having that VBA Excel uh, background or Python, you know, will only sort of help you in 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 those smaller roles. I was going to leave this one for the end, but you've introduced it nicely. How how, how much have you used MATLAB after graduating? Well, a fair a fair amount actually. I, okay. I need to be careful here because I'm I'm now I, next semester I'm teaching my students in okay. MATLAB. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, but no, it is a universal yeah, yeah. in chemical engineering. Every, everyone does MATLAB, right? From what in, I see, engineering. I mean, engineering in general. You know, something something I certainly didn't appreciate, and arguably it's developed more since we graduated, is these toolboxes which 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 come with MATLAB. They they don't come with 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 the student version. I imagine it's, it's something you have at an institutional level. But MATLAB is a powerful thing, man. It's mm. a company that's been going as long as it has because they're very good at what they do. Um, you know, so it's 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 certainly it's certainly used. Um, you know, in the context of research done by some of my students, even you know, MATLAB is arguably still the best option because it it's it's you know sort of centralized body that is responsible for the reliability. You know, so it's the whole open source versus privatized basis. You know, um, and so there's that rep re reproducibility aspect with which it's got going for it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's still a lot of very active, very good research, and I imagine industrial work being done in MATLAB. Um, it's 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 an affordability issue. It's whether you're going to work for a company that can afford it or not. Lou, I, I'm not going to ask you to defend MATLAB. I, I didn't realize I was putting you in that position. Let's bash another something <laughs> else. How much have you used Aspen since graduating? 
Yeah, again, a fair bit actually. Um, you okay. know, so that's good. Yeah, well, you know, that's with, great. With, with, <laughs> With my with my sort of specialization into thermodynamics, it's it's one of the it's one of the easiest ways to show students that fundamental implementation. I mean, anyone who's used Aspen knows the first thing you do is specify your components. The second thing you do is choose your thermo model. Mm. Um, you know, so that's it's arguably something which gets underappreciated for the exact same reason thermodynamics because you sort of you you, you choose something from a drop down list in aspen and you yeah. let's go um you know but it's it's it it's incredible it's it's an incredibly powerful tool aspen you know you can't underestimate the value you can get out of it i'll make the same joke again rubbish in equals rubbish out if you just plug numbers into it or completely illogical specifications on your unit it'll give you rubbish out but it can also it can also shortcut a lot of other things which will take you months and months to code by yourself. Um, you know, and it, it, I think it will remain a valuable tool for bigger companies in particular for the foreseeable future. Um, and so I think it's definitely still a valuable skill for graduating chemical engineers. Hmm. Yeah, just so I, I I haven't ever used MATLAB after graduation. Uh, okay. I wouldn't have considered learning it a waste of time, though. I, you know, there's there was mm. fundamental coding uh, that was there. Uh, mm. The plot the plots are amazing. I think if I ever needed to do, I know exactly where I'd go if I wanted to plot. Uh, I don't know heat transfer from a plate, right? As a as a function mm. of distance, it, it's great for that <laughs> yes. kind of thing. I just haven't had yeah. to do it yet. So yeah, um, yeah I, I, I think Excel many... could learn a thing or two about surfaces from MATLAB. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, Aspen. I think I've only used on one plant where it dealt with sort of uh, it was it was actually an ethane cracker. So the mm -hmm. thermodynamics around that and it, the, the process was clean enough to be able to use it, um, mm. if you know what I mean. Because I started in a in a solids handling place where yeah nothing's measured so. It's easier to do a mass balance in an Excel sheet than to try and, you know, pick thermo models for something like this, you know. Um, yeah. So, so, but but yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't say it's something that shouldn't be taught. Of course, it needs to be, it needs to be mm. encompassed, just like breakage functions for mineral processing. Even if you don't end up using it, right? You need to know mm. what's there. Mm. So yeah. So I'm gonna. I think we'll wrap up because I've taken up more of your time than I expected. Uh, what would you say? No, actually, no, there is one thing I do want to ask you before we wrap up. Mm -hmm. There are, I'm living in Denmark. People start work a lot later in, 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 um, th th than we did in South Africa. Uh, I, I always joked after moving here that I was the least qualified person in my company, uh, because everyone had a master's degree as a minimum. I was the only one with a bachelor's. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I joke about it and maybe there's a small inferiority complex in the back of my head. Um, I, I was able to do the work, right? But generally people mm. start working towards their thirties. Uh, they do their masters, mm. they travel, they take some time off. The welfare system here allows them to do that. So it's not a concern. Mm. Sorry, I'm turning this into a monologue. Back to Reddit, there's, but you'd be surprised how often the question comes up am I too old to start studying engineering or too old to do my master's? Uh, and I think, mm -hmm. well, you're still younger than anyone's going to start working in this place. So I don't know why you're worried, but you're so stuck comparing yourself to your peers in your immediate group. What are your thoughts on that, on age? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it's a Sorry, question. Sorry, just to button, we're, we're, I'm 31, right? I think you're, you're 30. You're a year younger, right? You're I'm turning three 30. days younger than you. I'm three days what? younger than you. Why did I? Yeah, yeah, I know that. But you, no, but aren't you a year and three days? Nick is a year older than us. Oh, okay. All right. Well, yeah. then who am I? It's, I'm thinking about someone. I'm thinking about someone <laughs> with the same birthday as you. Okay. That's a year uh, younger. Uh, okay. so, so we're both 31, turning 32. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Just for context. Yeah. No. So, I, you know, I think the, the, the cliche that you're never too old to start definitely holds. Um, you know, again, I need to qualify by saying in a, in a South African context, but, um, you know, certainly if we're talking about, am I too old to start my postgraduate studies? I think a, a big factor is what are you doing before you start your postgrad studies? You know, certainly in a, in a South African context, masters, bursaries, you know, the vast majority of postgraduate students 
uh, that certainly I'm involved with anyway, uh, don't pay to study. They, they, they get bursaries. They live off bursaries um, uh, during their studies. Um, and those bursaries are well, well, well below anything you'll make in industry. So that is a massive, massive caveat. Um, you know, so if you're someone who is working and wants to stop working and then start a master's, you know, th that will probably be the limiting factor for you. Can you afford to take a substantial pay decrease, you know, to, to pursue that? Um, uh, something a lot of people do is, is try and do it part time. Um, I can't speak from experience on that. I haven't done it personally, but everyone I've spoken to who has uh, says they set, has said that if they could have gone back and done it full time first, they would have because you know, trying to balance an, uh, an eight to four, nine to five job and then still come home and do three or four hours on your master's. Can't imagine it. So, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's it's massive respect to anyone who, who, mm. who's ever had. Um, PhD, you know, PhD is always sort of the thing that almost is a beast in and of itself because I think when you, when you, or certainly it was the case for me and, and, and remains my view on, on the matter is I, I think you do a PhD because you want to. A PhD doesn't, it doesn't get you anywhere that a master's doesn't, in my experience. Um, you know, so very much it's, it's, you could call it an ego thing, um, you know, or, or, or just a life goal, if you like. You know, I think very much a PhD is something you do because you want to do it. You do because you want to be in research, you want to be in academia. Um, Etc. And so, if, if that's the case, if it's something you want to do, then age, then of course, age doesn't matter because you're doing something that you want. Um, and you know, we're seeing it the world over. You know, the the academia is something that's incredibly difficult to break into because it's 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 a profession that doesn't let go let go of its older people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so trying to break into that is a challenge that many people know going in. Um, you know, so. Yeah, I suppose to answer your question directly, then, it, you know, if, if you're someone who's work, who's done a couple of years of work, is thinking of doing a postgraduate study, I think th the reason why is the first step. If, 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 if it's for self-fulfillment, um, then absolutely, you know, then, then, then pay won't be an issue. Um, you know, alternatively, if it's something to promote your career, then I would say it's something that you need to discuss with a line manager or, or something like that. Um, mm. But age in and of itself is, is not an issue, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I think that that's a sensible answer because yeah, the, uh, the only reason I am able to get into a place with an undergraduate is because I've got the experience. If I had been, if I'd taken five years to I'd, I'd do something else, uh, and then you, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to apply for the job that I did mm -hmm. without the experience I had. So, mm -hmm. so it, if you've been working, I, yes, and then you go do your postgraduate, I would think you really want to do that because I, I, I don't think I'd see a benefit to your career really because if you're already working in something you want to be working in, on the job training will get you more yeah, i think yeah. than yeah yeah so okay that's 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 interesting um final question for people like really shitting off studying chemical engineering right now any any advice I'm sorry okay when you say shitting off <laughs> <laughs> but just that <laughs> general feeling of misery and like why am i doing this and should i quit what do you say to them you know i think as it's something we touched on earlier you know it's 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 one of the hardest degrees in the world for a reason. Um, you know, it's a process that everyone who has done the degree goes through. Okay, qualify that. I know a couple of ridiculous people who never went through that and think we're all weird. But the vast 99% of us, you know, went through that same tunnel, went through that same stress. You know, it, 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 it's a trying ground, if you like. You know, you'll get there. If, if it's something that you really want to do, you will see the lights at the end of the tunnel, even if it's just a matter of time, right? It's just pushing through to the end. But I think that I think that is a big thing that people need to ask themselves: is 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 it something that you want to do? Um, you know, I think there is a lot of there can be a lot of misconceptions on what chemical engineering is. Um, you know, I think there are unfortunately a lot of people that get into it 
for the prestige, the prestige and the, the 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 wow factor that it has going for it, without knowing what it actually is as as a job, as a as a sort of profession. Um, yeah, so I think you know if it's something that you know you want, it's a, it's a matter of perseverance and really you know speaking as a teacher now, I suppose put more value on learning the physical basis for things, you know, and try and understand how things are linked rather than fixating on a, a given test or a given final answer. You know, I think that if, the, if there was one thing I could tell myself in second year who was failing halfway through the year, it would be think differently. Don't fixate on the next test. Rather, you know, Take the you know take the hits on the test, but really come to grips with what the subject matter is. It, you know it'll serve you better in the long run. Beautiful, Dr. Kripal, mm. appreciate it, Betty. Thanks, <laughs> Betty.